Thank you for coming out here on this very blustery day. Um, I know many of you got the same weather alert that I got, and I, deci I, was, I decided to come um, because I love data. And so that's how I am. But um, so I, my name's Deborah Gonzalez. I'm the Government Affairs Director here at uh, the Public Policy Institute of California, or PPIC. And for those of you who are not familiar with PPIC, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank with offices both in San Francisco and Sacramento. PPIC has just released a new report titled Modernizing California's Education Data System. It had a really sexy title before this. Um, uh, <laughs> about longitudinal data, but uh, apparently that wasn't cool enough. Um, it was authored by researchers Jake Jackson and Kevin Cook, with research support from Courtney Lee, all of whom are here today. We'd like to thank Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Sutton Family Fund for their support of this work. You should have received a copy of the report on your chair. There are additional copies at the back of the room. And the report, along with the slides from today's presentation, are both now available on the website at ppic.org. We'd also like to thank the PPIC Corporate Circle and PPIC Journal Circle for their support of this event and for our lovely lunch. For today's program, we're going to hear first from Jake Jackson, who will present the main findings from the port. And then PPIC Higher Education Center Director Hans Johnson will moderate a discussion with a fantastic panel of experts and finally, we have plenty of time for questions and answers. You should have received an agenda on the back of your, uh, on the chair, uh, on your chair and on the back of it, you'll see short bios of our speakers, our panelists. So in the interest of time, we will only do brief interview, our introductions today. Uh, please also note that uh, you also have an outline um, audience today, an online audience today. And so when you ask questions, um, please wait for the microphone to come uh, to you so that they can hear your question. A couple of things before we begin. Later today, you'll receive a survey. We love our surveys, and we hope that you'll respond to those. Um, you don't have to say I'm funny, but I really appreciate it when you do. Um, and lastly, please turn off and silence your cell phones. As I mentioned in the beginning of my comments, I am the government affairs director, but I actually um, also wear another hat. I get involved in data negotiations, and that's been something I've started to do over the last year and a half. Um, and we've had some amazing partnerships, particularly with the community colleges and EDD, but these agreements take a long time to get and sometimes delay work, important work that needs to be more timely. For some of you, you might think that this report is a cynical attempt on my part to make my job a lot easier. And I'm going to tell you that I'd be really happy about that. But there are also really important things uh, for uh, other people besides me. The reality is the data is not only important to researchers, but it's also important to the segments and the institutions. The legislature has rightly demanded that in exchange for more resources, the segments in CDE understand what works and what does it. And access to a data is an important tool in that toolbox. And while a more manageable data system would benefit the institutions, we can't lose sight of the ultimate goal, improving student outcomes. A well-designed data system should illuminate successful approaches to improving quality of our public education system, but more importantly, it should also protect student privacy. It's going to be a really easy bill to write when somebody writes it, a simple bill that will sail through the legislature, I predict. With that now, I'd like to introduce PPIC researcher Jake Jackson. His research includes work on college costs college readiness, community college uh, pr participation, higher access to higher education, and college completion. Welcome, Jake. Hi. Uh, first, I want to say a special thanks to the Sutton Family Fund and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for funding this work. Uh, also, a special thanks to Gavin Cook, my co-author, who's in the audience, and Courtney Lee, research associate, uh, who's not here today. Um, I also want to say thanks to you uh, because the type of people who would be willing to brave a rainstorm and a windstorm to sit here and listen to a talk about data, you're my kind of people and I appreciate you. Um, today I'm providing an overview of the report you have on your chair uh, or in your hands, um, which lays some, uh, a foundation uh, for some future conversations we're going to have about uh, a data system in California. Um, PPNIC, PPIC and other institutions uh, have put out multiple reports uh, about how we may build and collect and use uh, connected data uh, to improve education in California. 
Um, the PPIC Higher Education Center, uh, if you read our reports often, you know that at the end of almost all of them, we, we call for uh, an integrated data set. Um, so this is nothing new from us. Uh, this report highlights some of the problems with our current data system, uh, the current data structure, and how a connected data system might benefit California. Uh, so first, we know higher education is critical to California's future. Uh, most Californians tend to agree. 75% uh, of adults think higher education is very important to the quality of life uh, and economic vitality of the state over the next 20 years. Um, California has invested billions of dollars uh, in, to reform and improve education. Um, and while we've seen steady improvements, uh, for instance, graduation rates are up, transfer rates are up, um, even with those steady improvements, uh, PPIC has estimated that we'll still be about a million degrees short by 2030. The success or the continued success of the higher education system is really dependent on the linkages between systems. So for instance, um, between K-12 and community college or community college and four-year colleges uh, or any of those colleges in work. Uh, um, many new programs and policies have sprung up in this uh, area between segments, um, such as college readiness programs, um, transfer programs, remediation policies. Uh, and we're still left with many questions about the effect effectiveness of these programs and policies and many questions about these linkages in general. For example, right now, uh, uh, right now, California high schools promote career and college readiness uh, through their new Common Core state standards, are not new anymore, but uh, from, through Common Core state standards. Uh, but they don't know if their students go on to college, or if they go on to college, if they needed to take remediation, or if they go on to college, if they graduated, and they don't know if they got a job right away. Um, so in order for them to know more, uh, the data has to be connected. Right now, uh, California's education data systems are fragmented. Within each of those systems I just mentioned, uh, K-12, community college, CSU, UC, um, longitudinal data is kept on students. And by longitudinal data, I mean data that tracks a student over time from the time they get to an institution until the time they leave. Uh, for example, community colleges know when a student started, what semesters they attended or quarters they attended, what courses they took, uh, what certificates they earned and when they left, uh, among other things. Um, once, uh, once a student leaves that institution, say they transfer to a UC, the data on that student stops there. And then the UC will pick that new student up and track that student through the UC. Uh, but the data is generally not connected. Uh, without connecting this data across systems, we don't have a full picture of a student's development uh, and, their, and a longitudinal nature. So um, without connecting records across system, we can't answer some really important questions uh, that we may have. Um, questions like about the educational pipeline, uh, like which students successfully transitioned from high school to college and how do we get them there. Uh, about state investments, like how much does it cost the state to have a student uh, earn a degree through different pathways, say starting at a community college and going to a CSU versus going straight to a CSU. Uh, there are questions about the link between school and work. For instance, is California uh, producing the right mix for California's future economy and how can we do better? And then questions about interventions and program effectiveness, um, like which high school interventions produce better post-secondary outcomes. So connecting data across California institutions would help California answer these and other important questions. Uh, these could help institutions, they could help state policymakers, they could help local coordination efforts. Uh, first, let's look at uh, institutions. Institutions uh, will we'll get feedback and uh, hopefully it'll encourage efficiency as well. Institutions benefit from knowing uh, a lot about students' trajectories before they enter and after they leave uh, their institutions. For example, community colleges could benefit from knowing about the educational trajectories of their uh, incoming students and their high school courses and high school grades uh, to better place them when they get to a community college. They'd also benefit from knowing whether the students who transferred uh, did well uh, upon going to a four-year school uh, and then if they, went, if they were employed. Uh, connected data can also help evaluation and coordination with the state. Um, it can determine whether statewide programs benefit students and whether the state is making the right investments at the right places in the pipeline uh, to achieve its goals. And lastly, I think it can also help coordination. Many regional partnerships exist uh, and they would benefit from data that follows students from local high schools to local universities to local work um, and in efforts to develop their local economies. The idea of connecting data across institutions is not far-fetched. In fact, it has been done in California. Uh, researchers inside and outside of PPIC have done this uh, on separate occasions. Um, I list some examples in the paper and I'll list one here today. Um, UC Davis and Sacramento State researchers linked local high school course taking and testing records with CSU 
course taking records to, deter to determine whether the early assessment program or the EAP, which was delivered in 11th, 12th grade in high school, uh, reduced the need for remediation once students hit the CSU. They did find the program did help students avoid remediation, but that work never would have been possible without connecting these two data sources which don't talk to each other well. Uh, however, for this project and, and most of them that I mentioned, uh, the process of getting arrangements, uh, to, to making arrangements to get data from each of these uh, institutions, combining data systems that don't talk well to each other, can be difficult, expensive, and time consuming. So such connections are usually pretty rare in California. Outside of California, however, connecting data is actually a pretty normal idea. Most states have data systems that connect student level data across at least two sectors, as you can see in this map here. And while lagging behind the rest of the nation is not always the best thing, it does provide some advantages. For one, California has a lot of potential models for how data systems might look and how they might be governed. So how might they look? Um, based on California's needs, a flexible data system centered around data that's already collected and stored by institutions uh, might be a good starting point. A system that includes data from K-12, community college, CSU, UC, and the state's workforce agencies would answer many of the questions already posed uh, in today's presentation and in the paper. Data on when students attended, um, courses they took, and awards they received is already collected and stored, um, and they could be connected in one central repository. In time, if it's a flexible enough, uh, if it's a flexible enough system, uh, this could also they could also incorporate other types of data, uh, like early childhood education data, data on financial aid, even non-state information like whether or not students attended college outside of California, like from the National Student Clearinghouse or even not strictly education-related data like social services. Um, all these data could, could be combined together uh, in, in ways that could be useful, oops, in multiple ways. Ultimately, which agencies and institutions participate in the system would have to line up with what kind of questions policymakers in the state want to answer. Of course, how such a data is governed is important to the success of the system. The system will have to collect data from all the segments while ensuring that data is secure and privacy is respected. Uh, the governing body will have to determine who gets to use the data and for what purpose, and this is a big job. Um, they might want to co cooperate with outside researchers who are interested in answering policy questions that will help the state move forward. That would incre increase capacity. They might want to work with uh, local coordination efforts so that they can uh, do a better job. And lastly, the education data system, which has some support from Governor Elect Newsom, would definitely support any work done by a newly established higher education coordinating body, an idea also supported by Governor Elect Newsom. In fact, California's higher education coordinating body, old coordinating body, CPEC, uh, did keep and use some cross-sector data before it was shuttered in 2011. But when it was shuttered, the data stopped uh, being collected. It's not clear whether the new data system and the new coordinating body would be one or would be merged. Uh, for one, the data system might cover more than just higher education data, uh, especially if they include data on social services as it expands. Um, it's also possible that separation could protect the data system in case the new uh, coordinating body is, is also uh, shuttered. Uh, but it is clear that no matter what, this connected data would be integral to the kind of work that a coordinating body would do. Um, ultimately, only more connected data can provide a better understanding of the educational pipeline in California. I hope this uh, brief report and even briefer presentation uh, has shed some light on the potential that a statewide longitudinal data system has for improving education in California and set the stage for future discussions we will have about the details of such a system. Um, with that, I end the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm also guessing a lot of these questions will be answered by our esteemed panel. Um, they'll have time for audience questions after the panel, and I'll be here afterward as well if you want to talk. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Hans Johnson, director of the PPIC Higher Education Center. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jake. So I'd like to actually invite the panelists to uh, come up now, and we'll move to the next part of our briefing. Uh, let me just say that I'm really excited to have this set of panelists. As Deborah mentioned, their bios are in the packet that you got or on the agenda that you got. Um, so we have um, on the far left, Valerie from the um, California Competes, who is uh, sitting in for Londe Jose, who might be arriving at any moment, Valerie? 
we will see. Uh, Londe, uh, as you'll see in her longer bio, is not only the executive director of California Competes, but she is also the chair of the California Student Aid Commission, and they just happen to be having a little hearing about how to revamp our entire financial aid system in higher education in California uh, that is just, uh, just finishing uh, right now. Uh, next to her, we have Natasha uh, Collins, who is the principal consultant uh, for the Ed Education Assembly Appropriations Committee. Uh, and next to her is Laura, uh, no, sorry, is Colleen Moore, uh, Assistant Director of uh, Education Insights Center. And then finally, uh, we have Laura Mattoon, who is the Vice Chancellor for External Relations for the California Community uh, College Chancellor's Office. And each one of these people has been uh, involved in education data systems. Uh, developing either in-depth reports about how to move forward or on the front lines of helping us move forward as a state. And so I think we're going to learn a lot from them. I'm going to divide this discussion into three general areas. First, defining what we mean by a, a statewide longitudinal data system. Then secondly, uh, why we should have one, uh, what some benefits are and, and, if, uh, and certainly what some potential costs might be. And then finally, how, how do we make it happen? And so I'm going to start off with a pointed question for, for Colleen Moore about what exactly we mean by a statewide longitudinal data system. Okay, thank you, Hans. It's nice to be here today. Um, first, I think what I would point to is what Jake mentioned in his presentation, is that California already currently has four pretty good longitudinal data systems. It's just that they're within each of the four education segments and they're not connected. So for those systems, institutions within each system uh, submit information to their respective system-wide offices periodically, some information annually, some information after every term. They have information on students' demographics, the coursework and their grades, anything about diplomas or certificates or degrees that they earn. So a statewide data system could be fairly easily created simply by matching records across those four existing data systems. So it's not a matter of collecting new data from institutions or burdening institutions in any way to get a data system. We already have a lot of data at the four system-wide offices. So this is what other states have done in creating their statewide data systems that you know Jake showed on the map. They've taken data from their various segments of education, put them together. Most of them have created a data warehouse that holds the student level records. Um, so what California could have if we do something like that fairly readily is a data warehouse that gets updated periodically that allows you to observe, observe students' movements through the K-12 system into and through the public post-secondary systems. And given that the public post-secondary systems already get data matches to EDD's base wage file, we could also have information on employment and earnings outcomes, at least for students that go to college at some point. So as Jake mentioned, other information could certainly be added over time. Early learning is a big priority, I know, of the incoming administration. Um, I've heard people in that segment of education express a lot of interest in participating in a longitudinal data system. I'm, I'm less aware of the status of their current data systems and how easy it would be to match them and that kind of thing, but certainly that could be considered over time as well as matches to uh, public uh, or, excuse me, private post-secondary institutions who serve a fair number of California students. But to start with, it would be fairly easy to just create one from the public data systems that we already have now. And so that would be K-12, K the community colleges, mm -hmm. UC, CSU, and CSAC, or uh, student aid? Uh, well, you know, the, the public higher ed institutions already get quite a bit of data from CSAC, so I'm not sure you would have to do a separate match to CSAC or just take the financial aid data that they already get. Good, good. Um, so do other panelists want to weigh in on, on thinking about this sequencing, what you need to have as kind of the core starting components of a statewide database and then what you might like to see going forward from your own institutional uh, or expertise perspective. Laura? Sure, I'll start. Um, 
You know, I actually just came from the Student Aid Commission meeting on financial aid where I was presenting about the community college financial aid proposal. And I will say that the Student Aid Commission asked a lot of questions about data in our system, what outcomes look like, what our system's doing to improve outcomes. From their perspective, that having that information does fit into how they set their agenda in regards to expansion of financial aid. So I think having the Student Aid Commission link is a valuable um, piece of this proposal. And then the other thing I would add is just that workforce um, perspective. With the community colleges, we do track our students through a data match with the Employment Development Department so we can see wage gains uh, for students in programs. And I think having that across the systems is a really valuable tool as well. Yeah, I think um, in terms of the California competes perspective, we're certainly um, in line with having a, actually a P20 system. So I do think, right, the governor has expressed some interest in paying attention to investments in early education. And the only way we can really understand those systematically is to have a data system that collects that. Right now, from what I understand, um, the systems in sort of the pre-K early ed area are disjointed and not necessarily consistent. So there's still a fair bit of work to do there. That's not including, that's in addition to the four systems that Colleen has already mentioned that are already up and running. That said, what I would also mention is that I think part of what um, we can benefit from in having um, a statewide longitudinal data system that is P through 20, right, going all the way to workforce is being attentive to all the different sort of um, stakeholders, right? So I think Colleen um, and Laura even have mentioned using the data to understand our investments in higher education, especially, but throughout the pipeline. I think one thing we know from the various um, data systems and portals and dashboards that exist is that there is um, a need to provide data to students and families about the type of decisions they're making. And sometimes I think that gets lost, right? We need to understand these investments. There should be something that's for institutional leaders, instructors even. There should be something for legislators and the governor to understand. But we also need something for students and families that takes into consideration how they should be using data that is about the systems in their neighborhoods and communities. So that would be my sort of addition. So, and Natasha, as the legislature thinks about this topic, do you have a sense of what the core components are that they're thinking of? Um, well, the legislature has put forth a number of bills that would uh, create a system like this. And typically, they've included all of the education segments, and in some cases, early childhood education. Um, in others, they have also included uh, workforce development agencies in building this system. Um, Large, some of these bills have been held in committee, some have been vetoed by the governor, but I think it's pretty clear there's an interest in doing this. Um, the legislature also recently held a hearing uh, on the topic of establishing a longitudinal data system like this and its, its benefits and challenges. Um, as uh, Colleen mentioned, we have a lot of the information for certain core components of this system available already. Um, so it might make sense to move forward with those core components and then potentially add on um, other agencies, um, even things like um, corrections or Department of Rehabilitation, so we can really see um, student outcomes. So I would just say that there has been longstanding interest in the legislature in this topic, and how it would exactly be scoped has kind of differed um, from session to session. Um, but it seems pretty clear that the legislature is interested in including those those core educational agencies. My, my observation has been when we talk about data in California, um, and especially being a state that is the center of the tech industry and actually in the world, people start talking about big data and get really excited about all the things you can do with it. And while I'm excited about a lot of those things, I think at the same time we have to be really careful to ensure that what we develop in our state is doable uh, initially and that responds to the needs of the constituents, which include the, um, certainly the institutions, includes the legislature, the executive branch, um, but also does include, the, at the end of the day, the goal that we improve outcomes for students and, and for students and families. And I think we need to make the case about how we can do that, but um, and I'm not on the panel now, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm acting like it. Um, and I think we need to balance those things. So I like this, but what I'm hearing consistently across all the panelists is this idea of building incrementally, starting with what we can start with uh, and moving forward, and then, then at the same time, 
being mindful to make sure that we're showing uh, the people who are uh, providing this information how, how it can be used and how it's useful. So Londe is now here, <laughs> and I'm going to do the terrible thing, Valerie, <laughs> of, of having Londe uh, join us at, at the table. Uh, yeah, so uh, having you guys switch out. So, <laughs> thank you, Valerie. I appreciate your willingness to, to, to step in for, for Londe. <laughs> So I think that this leads naturally to, to the next topic that, that we want to want, want to discuss, which is what are the benefits? And again, I think we need to think about this in terms of to students, to the legislature, to the executive branch, to the systems themselves, and ultimately, finally, uh, to, to the state. Um, and so there are any number of benefits. We all sit in different places here. So um, I'll let whoever wants to start, start talking about this. And again, you could talk about what the costs are, too. And then finally, we're going to turn to how, how we make it happen, which will also include costs. I can speak a little bit about some of the benefits to the legislature specifically. Um, what I think the legislature has had to cope with in terms of policymaking and directing funding has been uh, largely anecdotal evidence and um, not comprehensive data on what's working and what's not working. And it seems that, that without that kind of basic information about how well programs are working to serve constituents, it can be difficult to direct resources appropriately. It can be difficult to identify um, gaps in services, um, duplication in services, um, and ultimately it, it kind of results in, in worse outcomes for students and for, um, for their constituents more broadly. Um, so, uh, I think that while I'm speaking from the legislature's perspective about how it can best direct state resources, something else that's also very important to the legislature is how providers, as um, Valerie mentioned earlier, how providers are able to use information to inform their programmatic decisions. Um, and so that would be, I think, another benefit that we would see if providers could access data, maybe it wouldn't be real time, but after the fact to see how their students performed, the types of things that are working and not working for them, they could adjust their programs appropriately. And I think also to Valerie's point, the consumers of these programs, uh, a longitudinal system would provide data to individuals uh, that would be participating in these programs so they could look at program Y and say, this program seems to be working for people with my goals in my area. I think I'm going to go to that program instead of maybe program X, which isn't showing the long-term wage outcomes or employment outcomes that they uh, might expect. Um, also, I think that having this kind of longitudinal data could help organizations like PPIC and researchers provide us with evaluations that would be rigorous and really um, inform the legislature on what's evidence-based and can result in um, good outcomes for their constituents. So it's my two, my, my two cents from thank, a legislative thank perspective. You. Thank you. Um, I could just weigh in with a couple of particular examples of, of how those things are all uses that you could have or benefits you could have from such a data system. Um, in terms of state policymakers, I mean, they've implemented a lot of very specific reforms in recent years. There's the local control funding formula there. There's the associate's degree for transfer, for example. And it's very difficult to evaluate the outcomes of these things without having data that crosses sectors. I mean, I get asked all the time about the associate's degree for transfer in particular because I did some research on that in the past. It's like, what's happening? Are students actually graduating from CSU faster with fewer unit accumulation than they used to? And how does that relate back to what they did when they were in the community colleges? Who knows? Because we don't have data that connects the community colleges to the CSU to do that kind of work. So that would help both the institutions to understand that, but also help the policy community understand the outcomes of a piece of legislation that was very important to them. Um, so that's one example. In terms of the institutions themselves, I think uh, Natasha already mentioned that they could sort of use information in ways that help them to refine their programs if they had better information about what students came in with from the prior segment of education or what happened to them when they moved on to the next one. But I can think of one particular example where it even might help them in terms of sort of state accountability metrics. Uh, so for example, a lot of UC and CSU students 
go to community colleges to pick up classes in the summer or even simultaneously during the term while they're a UC or CSU student. How many? I don't know. We, we don't have any way of looking at that. But that's an important function that the community colleges serve that they don't get, quote, credit for in any kind of metrics that we have now because we have no way of evaluating it or giving them credit for that. So that's just one other example. And there's certainly plenty of states with these data systems that have developed you know, kinds of dashboards and things that are aimed at students and families and the public the way Natasha has described. Go ahead. Can I? I don't know what's been said, so I'm so <laughs> terrified. I'll tell you what we missed. That's already been said. <laughs> well, all you missed, Lande, was we, well, no, it was very important. We had a discussion of what, what would be in a statewide longitudinal database. Okay. Um, Good. Which well, you, you know well. Okay. I, I have parameters some ideas. Of that. But I'm sure they've already been spoken to. I guess what I, one thing I would want to emphasize in terms of the benefits is, you know, when I talk with people about a longitudinal data system, I always say that the longitudinal data system is fundamentally our understanding of the student experience, right? Put into perspective in a way that policymakers, in a way that uh, institutions, in a way that researchers can better understand what is happening so that we can create and craft the kinds of policies that we want to see for students. And so when you think about the state of California, when you think about the demographics of California, one of the things that a longitudinal data system can provide us is an understanding of the equity gaps the deep equity gaps that we face in this state, as, particularly as they pertain across institutional segments, right? And that as they pertain to thinking about how, what throughput looks like for, in, for individuals, and what are the kinds of policies then that we need to, to back into. And so we want to be able to use a longitudinal data system to identify issues, to, to monitor progress, to make effective decisions, right, that benefit students uh, and benefit our most um, at-risk students in the system. And without that kind of system, we actually can't tell you as effectively as we would like to be able to what is happening to the student experience from, from point A to point B, which is not just what's happening within an institutional segment. It's across institutional segments. So to me, that is one uh, clear and important benefit. That's awesome. I think all of these um, comments are leading up to the community colleges and the place where you <laughs> sit right now and all the reforms that are happening in the community colleges that partly depend on getting and having accurate data uh, from other systems. So do you want to talk about that, Laura? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I did want to back up just a little bit to think about, you know, why the data and what is the benefit of data. And if we use um, the community colleges as an example, uh, we can look back and see how data is informed decision making in our system. Um, so I, I always like to highlight the student success scorecard, which was really revolutionary for its time in 2013. And there are actually people in this room who had a lot to do with the creation of that. Um, so it essentially created a data set that uh, disaggregated outcomes by gender, age, ethnicity, and it allowed colleges to look at program outcomes. And one of the requirements around the scorecard was that college presidents had to go to their boards of trustees and show this data. And that can have a really powerful impact on how colleges think about achievement gaps, about where to invest dollars. And so I think of that as one example within our system, and the benefits of that can really just be extrapolated as we talk about expanding that across systems. So I think about that as one of the benefits to institutions. But when we think about the benefits to parents and students, I think of something like um, our um, wage outcomes that we publish for individuals or for individual programs where a student can go online and evaluate different program offerings and see what, where would they find the greatest wage outcomes depending on their educational choices. So I think that can inform student choices. And then I think about AB705. So um, I'm not sure how many people in this room know what that is. It's got a lot of buzz in the community college world. But if you're not in the community college world, it may be new to you. So essentially, uh, last year, the legislature directed the California community colleges to place students into English and math courses, primarily based on their high school performance, and not the outcomes of assessment tests, which have largely been found to not be good predictors of how a student will do in college. And the challenge of implementation there is that we don't have a system currently that shows us what the high school performance is for all of our students coming into our system. So we've tried to work around that um, through an individual MOU with the Department of Education to get the course and grade data that exists in CalPADS. And you know, there's a lot of attorneys and administrators involved in the establishment of those MOUs. Um, 
And I, you know, I do believe we'll work through that moving forward, but it, it does create a barrier and a, and a problem as we try to quickly implement AB 705 on a specific timeline. Uh, so having a system that allows us to track students across, across all of our segments, but also allows us to see real-time data that can help us make individual interventions for students can be of real benefit to those individual students. Uh, and then I, just at the system level, I think about the way that data informed our own goal setting. You know, we established our vision for success and we were able to establish baseline numbers and clear goals because we have data within our system and because we have partnerships with some of our educational partners about what happens to our students after they leave our system. So I think there's a benefit now that we've experienced in goal setting and an opportunity the more that we expand this, this, uh, these data sets. And then on the state benefit, I think, you know, I, Natasha spoke a lot about how they can use this data to create that policy and fiscal environment that supports student success. And I think that's a, a really important um, note. But I, I also think that we have to be really careful about how we talk about data for accountability purposes. A lot of the reasons that there's so much hesitation with sharing data and making that data available to the public is because there's a real fear that it will result in blame and shame. Right, so how do we talk about data and about actual outcomes and about how we're serving our students without people feeling personally attacked by that? And that's a really delicate balance that I look to my partners on this panel and my partners in this room to help us figure out how we proceed. So that's a good segue into the next topic, which is how, how do we make this happen? And I think um, probably you're all 100% convinced that we need a <laughs> longitudinal student data system at this point. Um, and, I think the natural question is, why don't we have one? I and mean, I looked at the list of states, and, and not, not to say you know, anything bad about Mississippi, but they have one. <laughs> <laughs> and for a lot of Californians, even more motivating, Texas has one. <laughs> so there's a question, uh, and maybe we don't want to play this blame game. If no one wants to play it, that's fine. But why don't we have one? Um, I, I think that the research that I've done in talking to people within the systems, outside the systems, at the local level, the state level, and national experts, and in other states, suggests to me that, that the problems in California, the barriers to having a data system, are relational and political. They're not technical. There's plenty of people in this state who know how to do it. There's actually been technical plans developed in the past across the systems for how to create something like this. The problems are more of a political nature, both what Laura referenced here, the, the segment's concerns about how the data would be used and who gets to decide how the data are used and is it restricted to people who understand how to use the data and what kinds of interpretations are appropriate when you analyze the data. And also I think a huge barrier is that we don't have any entity with a cross-sector role. So there's nobody whose job this is. So there's no real incentive for any one of the individual segments of education to be interested in doing this, to prioritize doing it, both because they might have some concerns you know, that we've already expressed, but also just because they wouldn't necessarily prioritize it. Their top priority is to think about their own segment and their own currently enrolled students and not to think about something that's such a cross-sector perspective. So I think that's probably the largest barrier is we just, we don't, there's no who. Who would do it? There's so I, no. I, I've often heard even people in, in the systems that would be contributing this data say things like, well, we do it, but there's no, we're, it would be good if we were required to do it or, yes. um, and that's an unofficial statement, obviously. Um, <laughs> but there is a sense that there might be a vacuum in Sacramento in terms of leadership on this issue. And Natasha, I don't want to put you on the hot seat, uh, but you might want to talk about what leadership the legislature has had on this and where you see it going. Yeah, um, well, I, I completely agree that the barriers are not so much technical, although there, there probably are some technical barriers, but that they are with regard to governance, to privacy concerns, um, to um, the current administration. <laughs> Again, we're not playing um, the, the blame game, but um, the current administration has been reluctant to engage in this conversation. Um, but it seems that there is an opportunity with the, with the new administration. Um, Governor, uh, incoming Governor Newsom has indicated in multiple forums um, his support for this comprehensive data system. So it seems like this topic, we've been talking about it for over a decade. 
is ripe and um, that, that it is time to uh, really engage in these conversations and overcome these, these barriers that uh, are largely put up for, by political pressures and the like. Um, but I would note that while the legislature, I think, has shown that it wants to take leadership on this issue, that um, the political pressures and the ability for agencies to actually engage is also very important. I'll just use an example of in the past when the legislature has um, mandated that agencies share data. And that example would be the career, uh, the CTE Pathways Program, which for over a decade required as part of participating in the program that K-12 and community colleges share data to see how students participating in CTE programs fared after completing a pathway in high school, uh, what programs they engaged in at community colleges or what workforce outcomes they had. And year after year, the legislature would receive a report that said we were not able to link data, so we were not able to report on this indicator. And what's the recourse there? I think what the consequence is, is that we don't have that information, but we need to take a lens and look at, well, what is impeding this work? Maybe we do need to address things like governance, privacy, funding, and so on. We can't just um, put out a, have a bill that says do this. We need to create the, the context in order for the work to be done somehow. So let's let's talk about governance. Where, where if we create uh, a database, where where should it reside, or what are the possibilities? Well, um, I would just add to the last comment that I think part of um, the effect of being able to say we can't report on this is to create some skepticism in the building, even amongst staff, about can we really do this? So, um, so that there are kind of um, subsidiary effects around. You know, is this really worth doing? Are we going to dump a lot of money into creating a data system that no one will use, that no one will get the information that they need? Because at the end of the day, nobody wants data. Everyone wants information for decision-making purposes. And so that becomes a barrier, I think, as well. Uh, in terms of governance, um, you know, we have long believed that um, the state needs to have a, a an independent body that would actually be responsible for collecting cleaning, analyzing that data, and making sure that it's available and accessible to uh, many other parties. Um, there's a challenge in that, because I think that uh, part of the live conversation, as was mentioned earlier, in the legislature has been, is a governing body going to be about um, just about data? Is it about broader issues related to segmental coordination? Or does it become about uh, accountability? And whenever you start to say the A word, people get really nervous, as you can imagine. And so that has been um, a, a stumbling block in many ways, because there has, and I think actually, um, you know, the, the governor, the current governor, um, has, you know, at times been like, we want more accountability, and then that creates kind of some resistance on the part of the segments, and so you end up in this tension and this back and forth. Um, so I, I think, though, that there is an opportunity. Um, certainly, there have been many bills in the legislature over the last five, six, seven years around uh, governance. I know that um, this is something that I believe Senator Glazer is uh, thinking about, and we will see if there's someone else in um, the, the assembly who will continue to think about that. And it is something that Governor Le Newsom, along with the data system, has said that there needs to be some kind of coordinating or governing body. Now, the devil is always in the details in terms of what the actual responsibilities of that body would be, but we do think that there is a need <coughs> for somebody that is resp responsible for both collecting the data and, more importantly, for helping to analyze it. It is a function that was a function of CPEC. For a number of different reasons, CPEC no longer exists, but there are some functions of CPEC that the state actually suffers from not having those functions exist anymore. Um, I would kind of go off of that and say that I, you know, in, in past work, I too have recommended that California needs a coordinating body because the, the benefits of coordination go way beyond data as an issue. Uh, in my recent work, though, I separated out the idea of having a data system sit in a coordinating body or having it sit in some other state agency or office where its sole purpose is to do this, is to create a data system. Because in all the interviews and things when I talk to people, what I came away with is that that would be 
that, that would avoid some of the political difficulties that Lande mentions here, because the function of this entity would simply be to collect the data, to clean the data, to, uh, to administer or manage access to it by researchers or by a coordinating board if there were one, or by the institutions themselves if they wanted to get access to records that cross segments to do their own kinds of analyses for continuous improvement. So that there would be an entity whose sole job was around data, creating maybe basic uh, dashboards and reports for various audiences, some of these things aimed at students and families, things aimed at institutions so they could look from one year to the next, how many more of our students are going to college, how many more of them are ready for college and not being placed in remediation, that kind of thing. So they could do some basic functions like that and be more neutral in terms of the uh, having no actual power over coordination or authority, which could be a separate discussion. So one issue that often comes up um, and you've alluded to this, is privacy and confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So how have other states ensured that they have maintained privacy and confidentiality? Uh, is it different in California? Do we face unique circumstances? And, and, and how do we accomplish that? Um, plenty of other states have done this. I mean, generally what they do is that, I, I mean, there's an entire, the Federal Department of Ed has the SLDS, state longitudinal data system grant program where they have kind of put out all kinds of uh, information for states on how to do these things and data security procedures are one of the things that they've got advice about. There are national experts at the data quality campaign and the Institute for Higher Education Policy that also have developed uh, materials to help states figure out how to do this. But certainly it's very important to have, I think, somebody whose job is uh, that's typically one of the recommendations that you have a data security coordinator or whatever it is you want to call this person whose job is to control access to the information both in terms of technically how the system is designed and in terms of processes for allowing access to the data. And the fact is that once the data gets matched and is kept in a system like this, a data warehouse, it's generally de-identified so there aren't students' names associated with it anymore. They assign some number that doesn't have anything to do with the social security number that the universities use for that person or that the, the K-12 number that they use in that system. So uh, it's definitely a concern across the country, but other states are finding ways to deal with it. And to be clear, it's still individual level student data, but yes. it doesn't have their name, it doesn't, it doesn't have, have their, their name, address, it right. doesn't have their social security number. So there's no way, at least directly, to identify who that person right. is. I would just note that agencies currently do have security and privacy uh, measures put in place for the data mm -hmm. that they do collect. So it would just be uh, a question more or less of making sure all the segments are on the same page, that they're going to coordinate their privacy and security efforts. Because we're collecting this data, we're securing it already. Um, there, there may be, if there's problems with privacy and security, now there will be in the future. So one thing we haven't addressed yet is how much this might cost. Um, it's been pointed out that these data sets, at least some of the initial data sets already exist, so there's not a data collection effort necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, any sense of, about what the cost might be? Yes. <laughs> As we've been thinking about it, um, you know, what the cost might be actually turn on whether we think about the system as being a centralized system where we are kind of uh, collecting and maintaining data from all um, sectors and segments or whether it is a federated system where we are kind of linking systems. Um, the federated system is less expensive and we've estimated, and it may be a low estimate, somewhere between 15 and $20 million in startup costs and probably three to five million or so to maintain it. Um, a, a comprehensive centralized system uh, would have higher startup costs. We're estimating around $30 million um, and also higher ongoing costs from somewhere between seven to $10 million. Now, depending on who we've talked, we've done some research. Some people think that might be a little bit of a low estimate, but, um, but the, they're not gonna be huge orders of magnitude in that respect. And CPAC's budget was quite small, but CPAC's didn't budget. perform the same kind of function Correct. necessarily that we're talking Correct. about. Yeah. 
So uh, now I'd like to open it up to the audience. Please wait for the microphone, and uh, then we'll make sure that everybody who's on the web watching will be able to get to hear your question as well. I think we had, raise your hand. We're here. We'll get you next. Yes, please. OK, just quick clarification. And please state your name. And uh, Neil Kelly with the Chancellor's Office. Great. So Mississippi has a federated system. Mississippi State runs it. We had them out to California. We're going to use their model, but we couldn't get the agencies to agree upon using that system. Just a fact. But my question really is about undocumented students. So we have a large segment of undocumented students in our state. We don't necessarily ask if they're undocumented, but there is a lot of information about those students. Um, there are some barriers that we don't find out of why they can't go to through this segment or this segment. Do they qualify for free tuition? We can't find that information. So in this system that we're building, how do we gather data on undocumented students without asking that question that puts in their eyes themselves in jeopardy for getting deported, arrested, those kind of things? Well, I, you know, so I'm, the reason I was late is I'm on the Student Aid Commission and we were having a, a meeting today. And this is an issue that we have been dealing with in particular because um, we have students who apply for Pell Grants, but undocumented students are unable to access Pell Grants. And so we have a, the California Dream Act, which students um, can apply for. I think you know the, the privacy and security issues around undocumented students means coming up with some kind of student identifier that is not linked to, um, to information around you know, your, your legal residency. Um, and so it does mean, probably, that there are some questions we might not be able to answer, but I would argue that um, that is probably worth the benefit of ensuring that we have that, that information. Hi, my name's Angel. Um, I'm a previous uh, policy manager for the state government, and now I work at a nonprofit who deals a lot with data. Um, my question is, um, there has been a variety of efforts over the last several years on how to do this, and there's been trials and pilots. Um, you mentioned one. Um, others that I can think of is horizon horizontal integration. Um, DSS looked at that um, and is probably still looking at that right now. The California Workforce Development Board was implementing AB 2148 with the CalSkills project, which a variety of partners were on, including the Chancellor's Office, CDE, and, and EDD, and lots of other folks. I'm wondering what we learned from those efforts and if we're closer at all to implementing something like this. Uh, I'm a parent of four children. I'm a community co past community college student, went to the CSU, utilized social service programs. And so this really is really, really near and dear to my heart um, because it directly impacts the lives of students. And I want to know how much closer we are to implementing a system that does um, show what works, but also um, is very transparent um, and, ver and makes folks implementing these, these programs very accountable. Um, huge concern and I'm glad that you know I'm just gonna say my, my kids go to Sac City Unified and our new superintendent is all about data uh, and and would very much be in support of this so I'm wondering from the experts how much closer are we than we were in the past five years yeah, I, <laughs> I do think that um, one of the challenges has been um, direction and resources from the state level. And um, despite that, I think a lot of our systems have worked really hard to create sh uh, data sharing just between systems. Um, you know, but I think about just within my office, which is one that really tries to make data available publicly. We share a lot of data with researchers, but we have a really small staff. I mean, when I have a question about data, I'm like, you know, I have to go find one of the two people that have access to the system that can help me find it. And, so I, I don't think it's an, um, a lack of intent or desire in a lot of cases. I really think it's about resources on the agencies. There is a cost associated with putting this data into the system, uh, writing the MOU, sharing the information, making you know reviewing the research that comes out to make sure that it reflects everything we know about the data. Um, and that just hasn't been provided to the systems as of yet to help support it. 
I'm, I'm just going to add there is another um, more focusing on education a system called CalPass Plus, which is a voluntary participation of K-12 community colleges, some CSUs and some UC campuses to link individual level student data. We used it for one of our projects. It's very rich in, in terms of being able to follow a student if they're in the right schools, but the problem is it's not universal. It's not the entire set of our public system. So a lot of students we don't, we're not able to follow if they don't go to a, you know, a, a CSU that participates. Um, but what, what that data shows is it's possible to make these linkages. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible to use them for research, yeah. but we need state action, at least from my perspective. And I think there's another great example to Hans's example, which is the California College Guidance Initiative. And actually, right. our office recently funded a pilot in the Central Valley to try and connect data between the Central Valley K-12 uh, CSU Community College and UCs um, for both that purpose of ongoing research within the, within the region, but well as the opportunity for individualized interventions on behalf of students. So I agree, it can work, but right now it's really happening at that regional level when funding has been provided to support it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the regional. Kevin and I have done a lot of work looking at um, education pipelines in the San Joaquin Valley, and there's a very active group of educators and leaders in the San Joaquin Valley who are trying to answer some of the questions that you're posing. And they're coming up against this roadblock of not having the data they need. So now they're trying to develop these data systems and um, have said, uh, rightly, that if the state had something, it would make their lives so much easier rather than having to do all these, these one-offs that we've been talking about. Okay. Could, I, in, could I add yeah, one thing please, to her question? Um, I, I, from what I understand, you're referencing a lot of the social service networks that have been able to receive real-time data to see how individuals are accessing okay. services and where they're moving. Is that, that that's what you're referencing? Yes. So, yeah, so you can, so if a, if a student is in the Central Valley, they can access the data that the state provides. Yeah, so you can, so if a, you can, so if a, if a individual goes to um, a community provider, for example, that, that provider could see that what benefits that individual is receiving, maybe some of the interventions that they've engaged in so far. I would say that a lot of that is being, is being driven by federal um, requirements. And I think it's happening more on social services than it, that real-time data on the education side is. So that, that's just something I wanted to add. That I think it would be great if we had that on the educational side where teachers were able to see so much information, or see information to help their students and intervene. And I think the, um, the guidance initiative is doing that so counselors can get real-time information about how students are meeting their A through G requirements and um, CTE pathways and so on. But I think that actually social services may be ahead of education at this point. And the only thing I can really think of why that might be is, is a federal push for it and maybe, I, I'm not a social services expert, so I would think probably other political and relational sorts of um, advantages they might have. Yeah, I think it's also important to, to have this distinction between the kind of data system that, that Londe's report and, and uh, Jake's report and, and the ones I've done have recommended and this real-time data system because they're not exactly the same thing because the kinds of data systems that we've been talking about that are fairly easy to create, just putting together the four data systems that we already have would give you a more static kind of data system that would be updated annually or every term or something and allow you to do some research on what has happened to students and is it getting better over time and that kind of thing and use that information to improve your programs. But that kind of data system would not get this kind of C what CCGI does, which is like, you know, we need to, a community college counselor could look real time at somebody's high school records and see how should I be advising this student. That kind of system is very different and from the research I've done, it's, it's much more technologically challenging to do st on a statewide basis across all these various institutions and more costly. Certainly a valuable thing, but I just want to make sure that we're clear that they're not the same thing. Right. And to the extent that like, there's CGI, there's also UC's Transcript Evaluation Service. Absolutely. These are not mutually exclusive no. um, things. You could have a statewide longitudinal student database and continue with those Absolutely. efforts. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's also worth noting that the nirvana would be to actually get it all, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and, and in my mind, it's also 
potentially the, the politically feasible way to go. Um, if you're going to invest dollars, wouldn't you want to invest dollars that's real time helpful to students in navigating in the moment, to counselors and navigating in the moment, as well as providing information to researchers and policymakers about what they need to know to architect the student experience in a much more defined way. So yes, at this point, we you know the politics of it are difficult, but the aim should actually be if we if we wanted to go for broke, the aim should be to actually try to figure out how do we marry those things. I think that the, that would be a great goal, but I think that that minimizes the technological distinction between the two. Because what's very feasible at relatively low cost now is to create the research policy focused kind of data system. People that I've talked to about, I mean, none of these other states that I examined or that, that you know, were up on the map there have a statewide real-time data system. There's a reason for that. It's less technologically feasible. So if what you want is data in the near term to be used to serve students in the near term, I think that what you should probably do is create the kind of data system that we can now and keep working toward where the technology allows for a more real-time data system on a statewide basis. I, I completely understand and agree with everything Colleen said. I also think that when we talk about designing with the end goals in mind and we talk about the investment of creating, um, we, I, I don't see how we would work backwards. If we just create a longitudinal data system that only allows for end term research base, you can't build back from that into a real time set. But That's the right. opposite is true. Right. So you have to think about what is the end goal, what is the investment you're willing to make, and what, you know, how do we get there? Because the investment in that kind of a system is an investment that won't ultimately build back to individualized student interventions. But if we can get an investment in a system that can do both, I have to agree with Londe. I think we should try for that. I think that's ideal for serving our students, serving our colleges, and serving research. I think it also has the potential, though, just to, to, I know the legislature's concern with doing this in the past has been, oh, it's going to turn into one of these IT disasters that I think some of the audience was referencing about, you know, you said it would cost $10 million and suddenly it's 10 years down the road and it's been $50 million and we still don't have it. So I think that we need to be careful that that's not what we would create because then we'd end up with nothing, which is where we are now. <laughs> I've always found in my own research that if I have incremental goals towards a larger objective, <laughs> accomplishing those increments is really important. So I, I, I agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> but those increments are important. Uh, so we have a question over here and then a question over here. Oh, and one here first. Sorry. Uh, Carrick Ashley, thank you for the panel. I'm deputy. I'm, I'm going to add, sorry, ad lib that Carrick, you were at an event PPIC had, I think, about 10 years ago about this exact uh, <laughs> question. So the, the well, Colleen's coming yes, about 10 very, years later. 10 years later, here we I are. I feel very <laughs> successful. <laughs> so I'm deputy That's superintendent of the California Department of Education. Just so, just two points, and then and then maybe some feedback from you. Um, the first is I, I just want to address the issue of reluctance. Back around 2010, um, the segments got together, in fact, two different times the segments got together and, and created an application to submit to the federal government for funding. Some, it was supported by all of those with letters of recommendation and, and so forth. Um, and then when those weren't funded, or even prior to those not being funded, uh, or in between those two not being funded, um, the segments got together and uh, we all signed a joint powers authority, hmm. along with CPAC at the time, because it was still uh, active, um, along with CTC. So, so there is not, um, there's not a reluctance to do this from the segment, and I just wanted to make that clear for those that, that, that might be here or listening. Um, I, I appreciate the comments from Laura about, uh, about uh, staffing, um, because I think a lot of our resources have been spent toward building a system in the, each of the segments. But you also need resources for then sharing out the data or sharing the data with each other. Um, but that, e even with the lack of resources, I don't think that sharing has been as rare as, as perhaps people think. I mean, just CDE alone, six or seven MOUs with UC. We've got an MOU with, with CSU. We've got an MOU with UC. Uh, the Student Aid Commission, uh, you know, the social services. Uh, there, there's multiple uh, data sharings going on, but they are one-offs, right? Which is, which is what we're talking about. So, so here's my comment that, uh, for feedback. I, I think part of the reason that we haven't been successful to date 
is that we focused um, on the solution, that we focused on the technology, we, on, on what we think is the end game. Uh, you know, perhaps what we need, and I think Hans, you, you referred to this earlier, uh, and that is, you know, if state leadership could agree on the top five questions they want answered, then pull the segments together and say, okay, if these are the top five, how would we get these answers? What would it take to get there? Or maybe it's the top 10 questions. And then once we prove that that's possible and we learn from that kind of data sharing to get those answers, then we can talk about a solution that we want. Panelists? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'd be, I'd be happy with that as a place to start, if that's, if that's where we could start. Um, I think that that focuses in on the use of the data for the interests of the state only, which is only one audience that is potentially of interest. I mean, that kind of thing wouldn't result in students and families having access to any information that could come out of this data system, or the institutions themselves having access to any information that they could get out of it. So that seems to focus more on you state legislators, what do you want to know? Let us tell you what you want to know, that kind of thing. I, I think you know, there was a question about how to motivate this so, so that it happens. Um, from our perspective, one of the problems of understanding how students are doing in California, whether they're making these critical transitions from high school to college and then succeeding in college, is that we don't have a consistent system-wide across all the systems, longitudinal overtime database to answer these fundamental questions. And so I think the, w the danger of like setting, posing a set of questions is you'll get a, a set of one-off answers, mm -hmm. um, but it could be motivating in terms of, okay, in order to answer questions, these questions and questions like these, we need this sustainable long-term um, uh, database that, that, that can respond, um, maybe not always in real time, maybe eventually in real time, but certainly in time quick enough to be responsive in ways that we can't right now. And, and you've heard just these, some of these basic things. I cannot tell you how many UC eligible students don't go to UC. Uh, I, can, I cannot tell you how many don't apply to UC. I can't tell you how many end up at a community college. I can't tell you how many go out of state. I can't tell you how many don't go to college at all. Um, basic fundamental questions. And we'd want to have answers to those questions, I think, year after year. Um, so let me get to another, uh, well, any other oh, comments? I, I guess I just wanted to, to say that with the five, with, you know, five questions, I think the starting incrementally and showing wins early on to get people on board is really important. But I think my fear would be, and I'm thinking like how the legislature would write a bill, right? That's how I, how I think about this. How would, the, how would we legislate something like that? I think my fear would be, um, okay, we want to, we, we know we want to know remediation out of high school. Let's answer that question. Is it going to be one of those things where we're just sharing Excel documents again? I think what we're really interested in is a system that isn't just sharing these kind of disparate um, data points and documents, but really something more overarching. So maybe if it was something like we build a system that answers five questions, but then it's kind of like, well, why then only five? So th those are just some of my thoughts that I think we want to, I think that the, the end goal is something big with a, with a system that can answer a multitude of questions. But I really appreciate the you know, let's figure out what we want to know here, and that'll get people on board. And yeah. Do you have a question over here? And then we have one over here. Well, I think we're ready to go over here, okay. and then we'll okay. get to you. Uh, hi, I'm over here. <laughs> my name is Nadine. I'm a reporter with Capital Public Radio here in Sacramento. Um, my question is more of a historical one of how we got here. Um, I found it interesting that you all had mentioned that 10 years ago you were having this very similar discussion about implementing these sorts of programs. And as we dis as Jake discussed early on, most states have this sort of program. And so for me, one of the things that I wonder about is all of these things that we're, we're looking into, haven't many other states done it already? And what makes California unique in that it hasn't already done what many other states have done already? So that's open to all panelists, whoever wants to answer. Thank you. Uh, well, I think one of the things that makes us unique is what I mentioned as one of the big barriers, is that we have no cross-sector entity to take this on. 
Um, most of uh, California is one of only what two states in the country that doesn't have a coordinating board over all of at least higher education. Um, we had CPEC at one time who, as we mentioned, did do some limited data matching across systems and then that went away when they did. Um, so I think that that's a big barrier is that we just don't have anyone whose job this is to do or who sees it as their primary mission, their primary role, and they are resourced to do it. So that's a big barrier in California. When I talk to national experts across the country who advise states on doing this, that's what they pointed to me as. You need an entity whose job this is to do this. Well, I think that goes back to the current administration. The legislature writes a bill pretty well, much every to, year on this. We did have CPEC. We had a coordinating board. And then we had a recession, which hit California, one of the worst in the country. So funding was cut for that, along with everything. Um, we also had a governor coming in at that time that didn't see maybe the value of this as much. Um, we also, to Colleen's point, have don't have this. this um, we, we're very decentralized. Our educational segments have a lot of autonomy. If you look at a place like Texas, basically their segments are under one, are under the administration, and have, and uh, that administration has a lot of control over those segments and can mandate what they do. I think another reason we maybe uh, don't have this is some states like Florida, for example, which has long had a system like this, got in early and developed a centralized database, started collecting social security numbers for K-12, and was able to, um, to create this longitudinal system where we have, we got in a bit later and had a lot of concerns about collecting social security numbers for K-12 students. So we assigned them a different identifier, the uh, SSID, um, which could, that's been one of the technical difficulties that people bring up time and time again, having different identifiers across segments. So I think there's a number of reasons, but California I think is exceptional um, for all of them. I think they are exceptional in other ways, although I would just point out that many other states also have separate ID numbers yes, in yes. K-12 and in higher ed, and yet they have one of these data systems. So that's not an insurmountable barrier. The, the Florida model actually is interesting, not only because of what it does with data, but because of how it provides a basis for other kinds of higher education reforms that could also be significant. So one of the things you see in Florida is across, because it's a centralized system across your institutions, you have common course numbering, right? Which means that if you are a student who starts at a community college and then you want to go to a state university or you know the University of Florida, you know that English 101 counts as English 101 everywhere. That does not happen in California. Right? And so if you're a student at, you know, choose your favorite community college, you're trying to figure out if I want to transfer, how do I to come up with the requirements for UC Davis, for Sac State, for any number of institutions, and you're doing that college by college. Now the associate's degree for transfer has made a big difference in that, but it's not universal. And it doesn't really uh, you know, account for the UC. So I think that there, the other piece of a data system is that as we think about that kind of coordination and making it much more systemic, it can lay the groundwork for other kinds of systemic reforms that we would like to see our higher education institutions take on. I'm glad you brought that up too because California has, compared to other states, a lot more of our high school graduates going directly to community colleges rather than four-year colleges. So that transfer function and that articulation process, which we all know is a huge stumbling block, and there are there is progress being made, but there's a lot more progress that needs to be made. And this kind of data system could help provide fundamental answers about how to make those uh, changes in an effective way. And so we have a question over here. You've been very patient. Hi, I'm Hayden Springer. I'm with the Foundation for California Community Colleges, and I'm a Southerner. Mississippi's OK. <laughs> um, and formerly with the Labor Market Information Institute. Um, you mentioned earlier that the whole accountability piece per for performance is a huge hindrance. So I'm just wondering, we know we can do this technically. What would be some of your ideas for things that could be done to start to break through those more cultural mindset accountability um, issues? Well, my, you know, the first place I go is, you know, I really do think that this issue of a data system requires gubernatorial leadership, um, that the governor has the unique uh, ability to kind of set the stage around what is important within higher education. Um, as was mentioned, Governor Brown was skeptical 
of data and skeptical of some of those pieces, and so that was not his priority. Um, it appears that Governor-elect Newsom has that as more of a priority, so I actually think that that is um, part of the calculus that, that we ought to be thinking about, and I think that's why you've seen actually quite a few organizations across the state in knowing that we were going to have gubernatorial a change in leadership. Um, you've seen a, a, you know, all these papers and ideas and meetings and convenings around thinking about issues like data systems, issues like financial aid, issues like coordination, because um, there is a need and there is a thirst for those kinds of issues to be on the agenda for higher education. And so that's, that's what I am hoping opens the door. Um, it doesn't hurt that we have a little bit of a surplus, too. So. <laughs> Another question up here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pete Martineau, and I'm asking what is the uh, involvement level of the California State Board of Education, the State Superintendent of Education, and also the ver all of the school districts, how, mu how much are any of them involved, and how much do you want from them? I'll just speak on the school district and community college district side, that um, where we've seen data sharing work is at that local level. Um, you see uh, CalPASS Plus and CCGI working in communities across the state. Um, in fact, I think today there's a group of folks in Southern California who are local colleges getting together to talk about how what, what their needs are from this type of a system from the state. Um, so I think the, in, the involvement that they've had so far has really been by way of leadership in, in the absence of state level engagement. And what they can do for, for state leaders now is really inform us. What, what do you need from such a system to ensure that it helps you serve your students? And I, I think Carrick earlier pointed out that uh, CDE has been working hard to develop what they call CalPADS, which is a longitudinal student data system of um, K-12 systems, public systems in California. And so the, the districts have already um, developed that data set. They already send that information to Sacramento, and um, CDE has a very... Um, extensive effort in training and ensuring that that data is reported as accurately as possible. So they're already doing that. But, but, but what's not happening is, well, some of it does come back at least, but, but the cross-system uh, uh, stuff is, isn't happening consistently. So we have time for one more question, if we have one more question, and we do here in the back. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, there it is. Uh, my name is Stephen Burke. Um, I work for the state in uh, water data as an administrator. And I'm just kind of curious if um, you guys have looked at any of the parallels between any other of the in industries or the sectors. Um, <clears throat> I know that a lot of this discussion you guys are talking about right now for just getting the policy moving forward is kind of where we are. As you know, the policies are moving forward for water data transparency and sharing data. So I'm just curious if you know, that's an area of your guys' research you're focusing on and trying to duplicate to save some of the efforts. Yeah, I think I've, I've only looked at sort of other states doing it around education data. I haven't looked at what other areas of policy are doing it in California. Yeah, I think maybe the lesson there might be just that, uh, and again, I don't know the water um, situation so well, um, but in other areas like social services, and we've done work re working with um, Medicaid data, for example, in the past. Uh, there are certainly other agencies that have sought to try to figure out how they can work across systems uh, within the state, and they've been able to answer these, or solve these questions about connecting the individuals in one data set with another. They've been able to resolve the privacy and confidentiality issues. So I think those are the main lessons for us going forward um, in, in the K-12, uh, and I'm sorry, in the, in the um, educational longitudinal data uh, system uh, framework. Uh, so um, I'd like all of you to help me thank our panelists for the fantastic discussion that they've had. And please remember to complete your survey when you receive it via email. Thank you.